Hi, Karen Lacey here with Muse Stories, where we uncover the hidden histories and the objects all around us. And today, Melanie is not here. She is visiting her family in Florida. And with me, I have someone who is one of my old friends from the uh, San Diego Air and Space Museum located in Balboa Park. This is Gordon Perman. Say hi, Gordon. Hi, everybody. And uh, he knows a lot about many of the planes um, out here and a lot of the objects of the museum. So he's the perfect person to talk to about many of the pieces. So we're actually behind or in front of uh, this object over here. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yes. The aircraft behind us is almost unique. It's one of two Ryan X-13. Uh, those aircraft were designed to take off vertically like a rocket ship and land vertically like some rocket ships. Um, it was an X-plane, which means it was uh, designed primarily to test uh, ideas as opposed to being a pilot or a, an airplane you would make a whole bunch of and make the Air Force fly. They only ever built two. Um, this was part of a program right after World War II to use uh, all the technology that had uh, come out during the war to come up with new and more efficient ways to use aviation. One of the things that they thought about was breaking the speed of sound. They did that in 1947. Something else they did in 1947 was these. They decided to build this in 1947. Uh, they contacted the Ryan Company that was building very conventional airplanes at the time, the same kind of airplanes you see all around you. And they said, we want to see if we can use airplanes a different way. We want to be able to go straight up and straight down. Um, there was a Cold War going on then, and the thought process was, if the Russians ever attack us, we're going to lose all of our airfields and we won't have a place to take off and land from. So they came up with seaplanes, jet fighter seaplanes to take off and land from, from waterways. They figured there's no way that somebody can stop a lake from being there. Um, alternative was they wanted to be able to take off and land from people's backyards. Um, this aircraft was extremely successful. Even though they designed it in 1947, uh, the, or the, they came up with the idea in 1947. It was about 1955 when they put the design together, and 19, uh, late 1955 is when it had its first flight. For, an, for a test airplane to go all the way through the whole test program and never have an accident is very rare. This one is one of those very rare test planes that went all the way through its career and never had an accident. So you're looking at a really good product here. So the idea, um, all these companies, five different companies, made a tail sitter airplane and everybody was trying to get theirs to work first. And then somebody else did it this way. If you've ever heard of a Harrier, where you can take off vertically and land uh, horizontally, I'm sorry, you can take off horizontally and land horizontally, that idea right there took all of these tail sitters and threw them into the dustbin of history. They decided we don't need to go that route anymore. Now we have a Harrier that can take off and land. But for that brief moment, for about a five year period, Every, every aviation company in America was trying to make this concept work. And uh, you had the XFV-1 with Lockheed. You had the Pogo with uh, Convair built right here in San Diego. And the Ryan was also built here in San Diego. So lots of programs all doing essentially the same thing, take off and landing sitting on your rear end. Um, but this was the one that was really successful. This one proved that the idea worked. It was a jet aircraft. If you look, there's no propellers on it anywhere, like a couple of the other projects. Uh, this was a, a jet at a time when there weren't a ton of jets. 1955, um, about half of the aircraft in the military were still propellers. So this was not just an X-plane, this was a next generation X-plane. Um, this was uh, tested in front of 100,000 people in Washington, DC in 1958. Everybody in the capital got to see this plane flying around like a regular airplane, taking off and landing on its uh, tail end. It did all kinds of fun stuff in front of everybody, and again, it did it without any accidents. Uh, Skeets Coleman and uh, Fish Salmon, a couple other uh, famous test pilots flew this. Uh, so that's the Ryan. One thing I wanted to point out, if you look on the back, the backboard that it lands against, you can see that it's actually captured. There's a cable on the top. There's a hook on the back and the pilot goes up to the, to the panel and he hooks on to that. So try, try to imagine doing that, sitting all the way flat on your back. It's extremely difficult for the pilot to do that. One of the things they found is the pilots would get vertigo really bad. 
Uh, they didn't throw up, but they really didn't feel very good trying to, trying to take off and land from this direction. They found that if they painted the backboard a different color, some pilots would have more discomfort um, on a silver background, so they painted it yellow. Then one of the pilots still didn't feel very good, so they painted another background for him, a completely different color. So each pilot would have a different colored backboard when they come into land. I always thought that part of the training was kind of cool. I had a couple a couple questions. Um, sure. That was a lot of really amazing information. But looking at this, you know, two immediate things come to mind for me. Why? And then also the second one is, given that it's in San Diego, that this particular one was developed as well as the Pogo, right? Yes. Um, and we know that, well, we know because we both worked at the Air and Space Museum, that um, a lot of the technology for um, the Apollo program and the Mercury program, a lot of that stuff kind of came out of San Diego as well, or at yeah. least the rocket sure. ship part of it. That's vertical, mm -hmm. and the takeoff for the spacecraft is also vertical. Is there any connection in terms of the technology? Did they maybe draw some of that? Because it was a little bit before that time, mm -hmm. but you know, a lot of those, a lot of the guys, you know, were talking to each other. The technology used on this was used on a lot of our early spacecraft. What's kind of interesting to me is there is a program called the Dinosaur mm -hmm. where they took essentially a small winged airplane like this and they mounted it on the top of an Atlas missile and they were going to shoot pilots out into space in a little jet similar to this where they'd be able to maneuver around in orbit and then come down to land. Uh, this also has a little bit of the shape to an early lifting body. Mm -hmm. If you look, the, the wing is fared into the body in a way that most aircraft aren't. So th this was a time period where working on things for the Air Force meant think about space. So there was a lot mm -hmm. of cross-pollination going on, and I, I think you're probably right. There, there was probably some, uh, some equipment used on this definitely got into the space program. That's really cool. I, yeah. I recently just went to the Johnson Space Center with my family. I grew up super close to NASA, and at that point, you could go in and out of the buildings and no one would stop you because it was totally fine to do. And I remember going to the cafeteria era and just, just to go there and to see if maybe we can eat with an astronaut, which they were there sometimes. But nowadays it's a little bit different. Um, it's all gated off. And to see those same places that I did when I was a child, you have to go on a tram. But I went there with my daughter, who is three, and uh, she went there wanting to be a doctor and she left there wanting to be an astronaut. So. Fingers crossed or that an she is. Astronaut has, doctor. Well, we told her an astronaut doctor was a total thing, and nice. there's actually a medical kit that was on display. I like it. That was so cool because she just got super excited. She's only three, so she might want to be something completely different, and I support that as her mother. I just want her to be happy. <laughs> but back to the Ryan X3. Why did you want to pick this one today? Well, I picked the Ryan X13 because uh, even though this is part of our collection at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, as you can see today, we don't have it in our main museum, and for the last several years, uh, we haven't had it on display. We have it out here at Gillespie Field where mostly we work on airplanes. Um, I get to enjoy the X-13. Today, Karen does. Very few people visit, so I wanted to share this with you because I just think it's completely cool, and most people don't get a chance to see it. Yeah, I, I personally remember working around this. And I'm sure I dusted the wings once or twice uh, when I was working there, but um, I didn't actually realize that it had gotten taken out of the museum. I've been there since I stopped working there, but um, I didn't realize what was missing when they took some of the planes out to put, the, put in the simulators. And so this is, this is one of them. I'm not sure how I missed that it was this one in particular, because I always thought it was such, such a cool plane because of the X on it. Um, it's experimental. And one last question. Um, Given that there were many of them that were made, they went down this technology, the Harrier kind of knocked it out of the water. Um, is that really why they stopped and they didn't go, it seems like they didn't go past that experimental, almost in production phase. It, it actually happened almost overnight. When the first uh, Harrier lifted into wobbly flight, everyone on the whole planet realized, okay, that's, so it was just that done. replaces this. It was done. So even though um, it was a successful plane and it proved the concept, the concept is no longer needed. So it's, And what was the original concept for? The original concept was to give us uh, an airplane that didn't require any runways anywhere. Mm -hmm. You could take it off from anybody's backyard, from a parking lot, um, and the Harrier provided that. Uh, mm -hmm. So this, this was a, a great idea and it was very well executed, but it ended up being a technological dead end. 
So. Wow, and it's not really a technological dead end if it did end up kind of feeding its way into the space program, which sure. is, sure. Um, you know, continuing on um, with the Orion program. Um, I believe that's what it's called. I just went there two weeks ago, so I could be wrong. The, the one last thing I wanted to cover is that interesting marking on the tail. You won't find that on anything except an X-plane. It's most of the time when you have an airplane like this, it's going to have a national marking or something stating what company it's from. Nothing like that. This is a calibration mark. That a big plus sign on the tail is for high-speed cameras. So when it goes by, the camera isn't looking at the airplane. It's locked onto that plus sign. And it gives them a very stable track of the plane as it flies by. So that's really rare to see on an airplane, and it means they intended to really fly this plane. Oh, how cool. I didn't know that. Learn something new every day. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gordon. That sure was thing. so great. My pleasure. And I'm sure we'll probably be seeing Gordon a little bit more with maybe when he brings some other pieces for us. Cool. If you want to see uh, the Ryan X-13, it is out at Gillespie Field. It's the San Diego Air and Space Museum's Annex. Uh, it's kind of located at Santee-ish. Yes. kind of area so if you want to come out here it is uh, free to yes. the public yes you can call ahead to make sure that we're open that day but there's no charge come out and visit yeah, come on out and i know um they do uh there's air shows that they do out here and the museum is is open during that time too so you can kind of come over here and um see some of the planes take off you'll get a different vantage point but it's kind of fun to, to kind of be among this history that's here. There's so many cool pieces. Some of my favorite planes are out here, actually. The Bolero I'm looking at, the Vin Fizz. They used to be in the museum, but they were taken out because um, the museum needed to um, bring in some additional space for um, traveling exhibits and kind of a little bit of a change. Um, but they're out here, so they're still around, and there's many other pieces out here. So thank you so much for watching, and um, have, have a good fun. day. Bye.